Let's have a look at this first activity then. This is about the waterfall model, and we'll start with question one. A development team is building an online parents' evening booking system for schools, and they intend to use the waterfall model. Okay. Describe the stages of feasibility study and analysis and how these positions are different. Well, the point of feasibility is it takes an overview of what is needed to see if it's possible. And there are different levels of feasibility from legal to technical uh, to cost-based feasibilities. But we look at all these different areas and we say, is it possible to move on from here? Whereas analysis is once we've said that it is feasible, we should do it. It's where we do a lot of researching, a lot of information, at the, a lot of in-depth research and information gathering about the current system to work out what we need to produce to complete the project. And that forms a requirement specification. Feasibility is not as in-depth as analysis, although they are, on the surface of it, very, very similar things. Question two, explain the advantages to using a waterfall model when the programmer leaves the team. Okay, so if a programmer leaves the team, then we can slot in a replacement very easily as the specification, the documentation is fully understood. And that means that taking a new member of the team on board, we can give them that documentation, explain to them what they have to do, and they can hit the ground running. Three, describe a potential problem with using the waterfall model if they were on the implementation stage as the pandemic hits. That's that's quite interesting, isn't it? Because that was that was something that people didn't expect to happen. So what could be a problem as a result? Well, first of all, it's bound to have changed the requirements in some way. But they're going to be unable to tell that without going back and starting the waterfall process once again. And of course, the change in working arrangements with, say, working from home shouldn't be a problem because the specification should be clear. It should be easy to chop up the sections of work and send people home to work on them. They've got plenty of robust documentation to work on from there. So whilst the working practices should be OK, we may struggle with requirements changing because of the pandemic. Four. OK, now the team now want to add video calls to their product. That makes sense, I think. If you've got a parents' evening system and before it was all about booking appointments and suddenly we're in the middle of a pandemic when people don't want to have face-to-face -face meetings, then adding a video call component seems like a sensible idea. So how does it change the delivery date of the software? Well, I, I think if you're in the waterfall model, you can't just think about things to add halfway through. You have to go all the way back to analysis and work your way through a stage at a time until you can continue with your implementation once you've designed all the improvements that you need to include. So the delivery date will be pushed back enormously if they're gonna go back and work through those stages again. The Agile activity then is all about the same situation, but this time the team are using an Agile model. Let's start with the first question. Explain the difficulties in using the Agile model when a programmer leaves the team. So. Unlike the waterfall model, when a member of the team leaves, we haven't got a full specification. We don't really know what we are doing on a grand scale yet. So replacing people will be difficult as they won't know exactly what they need to be working on or the scope of the problem that they're developing for. That's not to say it's impossible. It is just much more difficult to be able to do that. Question two, describe how the pandemic would have impacted on the ongoing development of the software. So it's interesting here. The change to the working conditions, like working from home, may make it more difficult for the team to communicate. And since Agile is all about communication and working together and iteration, then that's going to be damaged by the fact they're no longer working together. It'll probably get back up to where it was, but if they were working in an office originally and are now working independently from home, there's less clarity about what they need to be doing. However, any new requirements brought about as a result of the pandemic can be built into the prototypes, into the development cycle, without any slowdown. So adding new features should be straightforward. Three, the team now wish to add video calls to their product. How does this change the delivery date of the software? Well, actually, it probably shouldn't impact on it at all. Maybe the change in working conditions might slow them down a little bit, but the way Agile works, it's very adaptive. So the delivery date shouldn't change by much, if at all. Adding features is expected as part of the iterative process, identifying new features and adding them as you go. So it's all built into the timescales already. Four, the team use peer programming and Sprint to deliver their software. Describe both methodologies. 
So peer programming is where we have two developers who code at the same time. You have somebody sat there watching called a navigator and somebody actually doing the typing, the driver. And the idea is that two pairs of eyes on code are better than one. So they can discuss methodologies they're gonna be using to build it. The navigator can spot problems as the driver is coding. And as a result, you get a better quality of code. Sprint is the process where we set aside a period of time to do nothing but code. And this is fantastic. And some of the best agile methodologies I've seen working in action, they have project leaders that actually stop other people from other teams contacting them whilst they're doing sprint. And this could be for a period of days or weeks. And this means that they have to focus on nothing else, no documentation, no fussing about, just writing code. And that means you can make masses of advancement in the software prototype over a shorter period of time. And we can get to the next review point and identify what needs to be done next. The documentation activity says to explain the difference between a technical and user documentation and why both are necessary. So let's start with technical documentation because that's going to explain how the software is built and could involve annotating the code. But the idea of technical documentation is explains how the software you're building actually works. User documentation then explains how to use the software. And this will be written for the technical level of the end user. If you are building software that's designed for other developers, it can be quite technical. But if you are writing software for non-specialist users, then what you're looking at is explaining it at the right level for the user. So this could be completely non-technical. Finally, why do we need both? Well, technical, doc technical documentation is needed for future improvements. At some point in the future, somebody will pick up the code you've written and try to improve or expand upon it. User documentation, though, it's only needed for the installation. It is needed to train people to use the new system.